Good morning, church. Happy Lord's Day to you. Pastor Kevin, good to be back here. So great to see some sunshine outside. Thank you for joining us this morning. A big thank you to the worship team for helping our hearts get right with the Lord and be prepared to receive God's word. If you're joining us uh, for the first time, you're our special guest. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we would love to pray for you, so let us, know, let us know ways that we can by responding, as you've noticed in the pre and post video uh, opportunity that you have. Uh, you can also email our office at office at trfefc.org, and we'd love to find ways and, and help pray for you and minister to you in this time of COVID-19. A big thank you to my brother and elder, Mark Schmidtke, who filled in very well for three weeks in walking us from Genesis to the kings of Israel. Mark and I had talked about this idea um, while I was away or was supposed to be away with Pastor Kent and his big brother Steve in Israel, um, but those plans fell through, as you know, and Mark was just the perfect uh, solution and a perfect, really, addition to our series. In other words, he has really helped us to see how we, how we got where we are today. If you missed that, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, because this is your first Sunday tuning in, check out our website, www.trfefc.org, or our YouTube channel, and you can see uh, not only Mark's past three sermons on um, walking <clears throat> walk through the Bible, Old Testament, or any other previous content. So again, that is www.trfefc.org. Well, without any further ado, <clears throat> let's stand together and read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. If you're looking for Samuel in your Bible, once you've gone past the first five books, the Pentateuch, you hit Deut Deuteronomy, and you're going to hit Joshua, and you're going to hit Judges, Ruth, and now you're at 1 Samuel. So not real far into your Old Testament again. First five books of the Bible, which end with Deuteronomy. Then you have Joshua. Then you have Judges, Ruth, and 1 Samuel. Let's read together. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Let's pray. Father, uh, we come before you in awe of your sovereign grace, which is traceable throughout all of your scriptures and in the lives of any and all who have come to you by faith through your Son, and have the Spirit within us. We can not only testify to your grace in our lives, but the history of the world and the scriptures that particularly speak of you declare that. Be with us as we study your word this summer, as we dive into 1 Samuel, an amazing book of the Bible, and an amazing hinge in your redemptive history, your plan of salvation. And Father, mercifully, that includes us. We were once estranged from you. We were once under your wrath, but we who are in Christ are now forgiven. We celebrate that this morning and we look forward to learning more of you. Please help us to be hearers and doers of your word. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Is God in control or is the world just a ball of chaos waiting for some fateful moment to ignite and blow up? Is God in control or is the world just waiting to explode. I want to turn to ballet as an example, <laughs> probably not the one you were thinking of, <laughs> but an example of that question or an illustration of that question. No doubt most of us who are listening to this sermon know something of ballet through Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker. Whether you've seen or heard an excerpt of it, it's become part of Christmas traditions across the world. 
So you no doubt know at least a little bit about ballet. It is the highest form, arguably, of dance. It requires the greatest physical exertion and artistic uh, demands and skill because of just the incredible difficulty of the form. And yet, when done properly by a gifted ballet dancer or a prima ballerina, to the audience, ballet looks to be effortless and seamless and, and so controlled and so beautifully articulated. It's inspiring. It draws our eyes to heaven in many ways. May 29th, 1913, the audience in that very famous brand new um, location, <clears throat> the theater of Champs-Élysées, were expecting this beautiful art form, this majestic beauty of ballet, and they were well, let's just say a little surprised when Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring began. Stravinsky, being a very young and at that point not well-known composer, now on the other side, uh, arguably one of the most famous composers to emerge in the early uh, 20th century. But that audience of aristocrats and well-dos were not only upset, but rumor has it, and we can't confirm this, but the police had to be called to break up some of the uh, <laughs> upset patrons uh, at what they saw on the stage. They did not see an orderly art form. They didn't see the beauty they were expecting. They saw chaos. Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring is chaotic. It is dissonant. Even the rhythms at times are purposefully clashing. So the dancers themselves looked bizarre to say the least, grotesque on the other extreme. The audience saw chaos as Stravinsky desired it, but they saw chaos and they were not only upset, they were enraged, many of them. It was not the opening he had hoped for, but it serves, I hope, as an illustration that will set the context for where we find ourselves in 1 Samuel. The danger of jumping into a book is forgetting what's come before. And 1 Samuel, as Mark so helpfully guided us to, is coming out of the time of the judges. Samuel will be the last judge, though we do not know him yet, as of the first verse of 1 Samuel. And Judges, friends, is like Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. It is chaos. There's not harmony. There's dissonance. There's not easily tap your foot meter and rhythm. It is chaotic. It offends the reader. Any audience, so to speak, of Judges, if you read it through this week, you really, you're sick to your stomach by the end of Judges. I know there are bright spots. Deborah and <clears throat> Samson of course, Gideon, and perhaps the brightest spot is Ruth, which is a separate book but takes place during the time of Judges. But in the end, the refrain of Judges is still just as awful as it was at the beginning of chapter 1, 2, and 3 of Judges, which I encourage you to read in our Digging Deeper section in our weekly newsletter. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the refrain, that's the theme of Judges, and that's where we find Samuel. That's where we find a couple. That's where we find hope. Picking up in verse 1 again. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah, and Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This is our introduction to the book and to some of the main characters of the early section, which reminds me, let me give you our main sections of 1 Samuel, and then I want to walk through our main points for the sermon today. Our main sections of Samuel divide 
in two chapters, one through seven, chapters one through seven, focus on Samuel, the prophet God provided. And if you want to write that down, I'll repeat it again. Chapters one through seven of Samuel focus on the prophet, the God that God provided. Again, the prophet God provided, that is Samuel. Chapters eight through 15, the camera shifts to focus on Saul, the king the people wanted. Saul, the king the people wanted. And finally, chapters 16 to the end, shift focus to David, the king the Lord provided. David, the king the Lord provided. So walking through those real quickly again, chapters 1 through 7 focus on Samuel, the prophet God provided. Chapters 8 through 15 focus on Saul, the king the people wanted. And chapters 16 and following focus on David, the king the Lord provided. Today we're going to unpack three major sections of the opening of Samuel. So within the larger focus of Samuel, the prophet God provided, we're going to see first, or I should say hear, the prayer of faith from a woman desperate for God's grace. We're going to hear the prayer of faith from a woman desperate for God's grace. We're going to witness God's gracious answer to her request. And finally, we're going to worship along with Hannah as she responds to God's grace. So we're going to hear the prayer of faith, witness God's gracious answer, and worship along with Hannah. Well, we met Hannah in verse 2, and her husband, Elkanah. Elkanah is a Levite. So this is a priestly family. And as we walk through this passage, I don't want him to go unnoticed. He's not the main focus, but friends, don't mistake his devotion and his character as it is formative and a part of the history, not only of Hannah, but of Samuel. Well, we come upon Hannah and the other wife, Peninnah. We believe that Hannah is most likely the first wife, but because she had no children, and because children or property is passed down through the oldest son, Elkanah marries a second. We don't know this for sure, but it's a reasonable assumption. So Hannah's the first wife, but cannot have children. For whatever reason, we don't know. Panina is the second wife, and she has children, several. And that allows um, Elkanah's sons to inherit the property, as provided by the law. Picking up in verse 3 now. Now this man, Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. So we meet Elkanah, and now we learn about his character. We know that he's a Levite, and we see that he is a devout man of faith. This isn't an external, uh, quote-unquote, Levite. He, he is internally devoted to the Lord, as his tribe was set apart to do so after the Exodus. And they go up year by year to Shiloh. The temple does not exist yet, for Solomon has not been born, but the tabernacle resides in Shiloh. And he goes up there to sacrifice with his family. Now, we will meet Eli and his sons uh, of ill repute, to use the older language, uh, in a little bit. They're mentioned here, and as often with a good story, introduced to us so that we understand a little bit of how they fit in and we'll better uh, see them when they are the focus uh, in weeks to come. They come to the temple, I'm sorry, to the tabernacle. In verse 4, on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? And here we have the problem. Poor barren Hannah and the torture that she receives from from Peninnah. It's cruel. It's evil. And we see her husband's heart for her. Let's unpack those in order there. 
Hannah is, as we've noticed, barren. She's the first wife. And the second wife wastes no time in running it, rubbing it in. And every year she has to endure what should be a time of worship and joy and celebrating the Lord, it is a time of grief and great sorrow for her. Benina is cruel. There's no way around it. She takes advantage of this sister and heaps upon the abuses. Now Elkanah could be seen here in a feminist light as being an ignorant man to say, aren't I you know, worth all the sons that you could ever have? But that's not the way we should read this. In fact, that's not even culturally appropriate. He's, he's reminding his wife he did not marry her for her ability to have children. He married her because he loves her. And isn't that worth something, Hannah? Isn't that worth something? I don't value you for the fact that you can or cannot have kids. I love you. And he shows that in the double portion that he gives to her. Well, verse 9, in this particular instance, this yearly tradition in this year, in this instance, after they'd eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she, that was Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. You can imagine the scene. Hannah leaves the table crying. Elkanah has seen this before. Peninnah may rejoice wickedly in her heart. She finally got to her again. She gets Elkanah all to herself and maybe more food too. Hannah leaves distraught. She's left to go outside of the tabernacle, which is in shorthand called the temple here. <clears throat> and she is weeping and Eli sees her, but cannot hear her. Hannah makes a vow, which is not disallowed in the Old Testament, but a vow is a serious thing. The law requires a person to take the vow to keep the vow. So Hannah's vow here is very serious. And her distress is just as serious, friends. And her prayer, which is rooted in faith, is just as serious too. So let's just pause real quick and remind ourselves that we should allow for all the emotions as Christians. There is nothing wrong with Hannah's distress. There's nothing immoral about it. It is understandable. Her grief is great. And that does not wash away her faith. For her vow here, as we just read, is sincere and is rooted in her faith. That God can answer. And that if he should, then she would offer up her son as a servant. As she notes here, no razor would touch his head. It's the idea that the Nazarite vow mentioned in the Pentateuch, the law. So, O Lord of hosts, she says, O Lord who can gather all the armies of the angels and the armies of Israel, the mighty Lord, if you would provide me a son and look on your afflicted servant, then I will give my son to the Lord, she says. Well, as she continues praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Hannah says, Eli, I have not been pouring out drink after drink to drown my sorrows as you have seen others do. I've been pouring out my heart to the Lord. She doesn't respond in anger as I frankly probably would have. She responds respectfully. It is admirable the way Hannah responds. She says, picking up in verse 16, do not regard your servant as a worthless woman for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace. 
and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went away, went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. So Eli hears her response and recognizes his error. And rather than continue to rebuke her for drunkenness, he blesses her as a priest should and blesses her saying, may the Lord give you peace and may the Lord of Israel grant your petition that you've made of him. And friends, in verse 18, if you didn't notice it, her prayer is answered and so is Eli's. The woman, then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. Hannah's Faith and the prayers of Eli, the blessing of Eli and her prayers to the Lord have been answered. She now has peace. Come what may, she has peace. Oh, the power of prayer. Let's keep reading. Verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to the house, their house at Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked him from the Lord. This is the climax of the story. Hannah has her prayers answered. Hannah went back to the house. Her and her husband were together. And in due time, she conceived. I think, friends, we can assume from that. It doesn't mean it was right away. But in time, Hannah's prayers were answered. <clears throat> Notice verse 20. In due time, Hannah conceived, we read that, and called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Samuel's very name is a play on that phrase, asked the Lord. His very name is constructed to sound very similar to that phrase. Hannah names her son after the Lord whom gave her her son. It's embedded in his very name. He is a gift from God. Hannah, if you may remember or may not know, her name literally means grace. The English Translation sometimes from the Greek is Anna. So Anna or Hannah mean grace. Hannah has lived a life where it has seemed like she has received anything but grace. And Peninnah was very quick to point it out. From the audience's eyes, from an observer's eyes, Hannah had anything but a blessed life, a graced-filled life. But now that has changed. And she is full and her cup overfloweth. And names her son in light of God's grace to her. Hannah, friends, as, as I said earlier, offers up a prayer of faith as a desperate woman and she now receives God's grace. We hear the prayer and now we get to witness the gift. It reminds me of a, of a, a crucial point brought up by one of the commentators that should, should be mentioned. Our God loves to shine in the hardest of circumstances. Our Heavenly Father loves to be glorified and to meet the needs of his people when no one else can. We see that here with Hannah. And we are going to see how her son will be the answer to the prayers of the faithful in Israel when everything looks so dark during the time of Judges, Samuel will be that vehicle for God to shine greatly and ultimately through his king, David, and ultimately, ultimately through his son, King Jesus. Let's keep reading. Verse 21, the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained, and she nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up along with her, uh, up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. 
Most likely Samuel is three years old. That seems to be the consensus on when you would wean your child in Israel at that time. So Samuel is very, very young. <clears throat> Elkanah goes up. Hannah says, let me stay back. So she stays back for two or three years until he is weaned. And now she comes up, bringing along with her the other offerings and her son, who will be her offering. It does remind me, friends, of a general truth about worship. Worship demands an offering. Worship demands sacrifice. Our worship here together with the musicians and the singers, we offer a sacrifice to the Lord. It's not about us, it's about him. And it's about our giving him our time and our voice and the glory that he deserves. Let's watch Hannah do that with Samuel. So she, in verse 25, slaughters the bull. I'm sorry, they slaughter the bull. And, uh, and they brought the child to Eli. And she says, oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. Do you hear the language here? And can you, can you hear the spirit of Hannah as you read those words? This is not a woman resigned, almost depressed with the thought of giving her son to Eli for his service to the Lord. This is a woman who's joyful. This is a woman who is reminding the priest, remember me, I was that woman weeping in despair. And now look, God answered, just as you and I hoped he would. I don't see a woman here resigned to some dutiful obedience. Because friends, that's not worship. That's just duty. Our father does not want our duty. He wants our hearts. He wants a heart that is willingly and joyfully worshiping. We see that with Hannah. We see that with Hannah here. So... She offers her son as being lent to the Lord. It's a funny word. It may not be the best word to translate the idea, but it's really a playoff of Samuel's name. It's the opposite of asking. It's the giving part. So in essence, Hannah is saying, Lord, you gave me Samuel, and now I am giving him back to you. He is yours as long as he lives. We at the church here practice baby dedication. And Samuel is often read when we practice baby dedication because we want our families and our husbands and wives to remember that our children are a gift. And we are stewards. We are but stewards of their lives. And we want them ultimately to serve Jesus, to serve God the Father, Jesus' his Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see that here with Hannah in the extreme sense. For friends, we... We must remember now that Hannah, with all the joy that she has, and it seems genuine, knows that she will not see her son again until a year later on his fourth birthday, and in his fifth year, and his sixth, for they only travel there once a year. Perhaps she sneaks in a visitor or two, but we don't know that. At this point, all we know is that Hannah is lending her son, giving back her son to the Lord for priestly service, and she will not expect to see him but once a year. Verse 1 of chapter 2 begins our third and final point. We've heard Hannah's prayer of faith, a woman desperate for God's grace. We've witnessed God's grace and gracious gift to her and her request and now we worship with Hannah, not only in the giving of the gift of Samuel, but also in her prayer of praise here. Almost like a mini psalm within chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. So we're going to worship and continue to worship along with Hannah as she responds. Hannah prays, verse 1 of chapter 2, and says, My heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. These first three verses are personal. 
Hannah exalts personally in the Lord. She derides her enemies because she rejoices in God's salvation. She recognizes there's none holy like the Lord and rebukes those who would talk proudly. Perhaps she has Panina in mind here. But as this is a prayer of praise and worship, it also applies to the greater nation of Israel as well and to God's people here today that we can exalt in the Lord and not let our enemies get the best of us, not let our enemies who are proud and, and say terrible things about the Lord. We know that he is a God of knowledge, the second part of verse three, and by him, Actions are weighed and he will judge. Verses four through eight now focus on God's heart for the marginalized, for God's heart for the humble, of which Hannah is one. The the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren is born seven, and she who had many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. Underline that. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. Friends, there is no way that our God is out of control or lost control. In answer to our earlier question, if we ever wonder if there really is a God or if this world is just a big ball of chaos, Hannah helps us answer that clearly right here. God is in control. God is in control. God was in control of Hannah's barrenness God is in control of the judges and their wickedness. Sin cannot conquer the Lord. John Gallagher, just four weeks ago, reminded of that in Joseph's life. What his brothers meant for evil, God intended for good. And though it looks very dark right now in our world, and I, if I'm honest, I am very discouraged by COVID-19 and the isolation, and I'm questioning our governing authorities at at a level I shouldn't, because I know that God is still sovereign over them. And I have to remind myself that, friends, and so do you. God is not into chaos. He's in control, even when it seems like he's not by our finite eyes. Hannah here sees past what's right in front of us, to what's behind it. And that is God's sovereign and providential control. Notice some of the examples she walks through here of ways he is in control. (laughs) He, He breaks the bows of mighty and he exalts the humble. He feeds those who are hungry. He, he, he gives the barren woman children. He kills and he brings to life. He makes poor and he makes rich. The pillars, verse 8, of the earth of the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. This last section I really want to focus on as we close, verses 9 and 10, and then the closing comments here in verse 11. Verse 9, he that is the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, the Lord of hosts, will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Did you hear that? Your heavenly Father guards your feet, Christians. He watches your every step. Children, God watches over you. He guards you with his angels at night when you sleep. As you get older, children, you're going to have stories just like your mom and dad and your grandma and grandpa. 
The stories that say, oh, I, I can't believe I wasn't hurt more when I did that, or, or I can't believe, you know, this didn't break this or whatever. Well, God is watching over you. He's sovereign over your life. Now, that's not a license to be foolish, but may it be a comfort. He's in control. And the wicked must also know that as well. For not by might shall a man prevail. If only our country and our nation could hear that and fear the God that they shake their fist at. Verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the earth, the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the priest. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. The Lord will break his adversaries into pieces. God's judgment is coming. I know it's not easy to talk about, and it's certainly disturbing to think about, but it's coming. And woe to him or to her who is an adversary. Woe to him or her who turns their heart from their creator and rejects the salvation made through the Savior and decries the spirit which can give life. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And here Hannah taps in to the string woven back in Deuteronomy and Exodus and in the, the, the law Moses mentions that Israel will one day cry out for a king, but God will be the one to choose him. This is not unseen. Maybe Hannah remembers that, or maybe this is just a prophetic utterance. We don't really know, but it doesn't matter. Hannah has tapped in to the tapestry, to, the, to this promise that God is going to rule his people eventually through a king. And as we will see in chapters 8 and following, Israel's going to choose a king of their own liking. And they're going to learn that lesson the hard way. And then God will choose a king after his own heart, David. And then we fast forward to Luke chapter 1. And God himself is born of a virgin. And Jesus himself, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, walks the earth in flesh. Friends, as we close our time May you know the God of control, the God of peace. May you, like Hannah, whatever your circumstances are, believe that God can work even in the hardest of times and that he does not bring hardship to hurt you, but to harness your worship, to turn your hearts from cursing him, from working at it by your own strength, to just be still and know that he is the Lord and to worship him in holiness. May you this week know his peace through his son, by his spirit. And to our dear men and women and families who have lost loved ones as we celebrate this Memorial Day, who've lost loved ones in the service, may you especially, as you grieve the loss of your sons or daughters, your children, your brothers, your uncles, your aunts. May you especially know the peace of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we close in prayer because we believe you to be sovereign over all things. We believe you to be the great composer. You do not lose, you do not lose any control over the orchestra of life. And that you sent your son, if you will, to be the conductor, the one who helps to shape us from being discordant instruments of chaos and of selfishness, doing what is right in our own eyes and turning our hearts to worship you and to offer up a beautiful harmony of praise. Continue your work in us, Father, this week. Continue to give us the courage and the faith and the joy that we need to continue to worship you and to love our neighbors in this time of isolation. Father, we pray for our authorities. We don't understand at times why. Father, give us wisdom and give them 
particularly wisdom to move forward in a way that both provides safety, but also provides for the people who are safe and healthy. Help our businesses, Father, who are hurting. Mm. Help us, Father, to be honest about any of our mental health struggles and to get the help we need in this time. There's no shame in owning that I struggle or we struggle with depression. Father, help us to be humble like Hannah and to seek you in prayer and to get the help we need. Bless us this week, Father, and bring us back to worship you anew next week. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.